Happy Lord's Day and welcome back to our study of 2 Corinthians. Today's text is the culmination of everything that Paul has been writing for in this letter. Everything's come to a head uh, because this, this whole thing, everything that he's written up to this point, has been about defending his ministry to Corinth. They have been doubting him. Some of these are doubts that they've come up with themselves. Um, some of these are doubts that have been, well, many of these are doubts that have been planted in their minds by some other people that they have been listening to. All right, so Paul started by defending his own choices, um, things that per, mainly pertaining to his travel itinerary, uh, things that were causing doubt um, in Corinth, just among themselves. But he has spent most of this time contrasting himself over and against uh, some of these other people that they've been listening to. And, it, and Paul has been showing his ministry to be genuine. Right? He has described his ministry as a ministry of the Spirit, a ministry of righteousness, a ministry of reconciliation. And he's done that, he, and he says he's, he's proven that, he's shown that, because his ministry is patterned after the cross, patterned after the death of Christ. Now, because of that, it looks like death to the world just as Christ crucified looks like death to the world. The, the crucifixion is a scandal to everybody. Um, it's a scandal to Jews. It's, a, it's foolishness to Greeks, as uh, Paul said in the first letter. It just doesn't make any sense. Why, you know, why are the Christians worshiping a guy that got killed, you know, the guy that Rome beat? And Corinth has been asking themselves similar questions about Paul, because Paul is imitating Christ. And what Corinth isn't getting, in, and what Paul has been trying to get across to them, is that just as he has imitated Christ's death, so also do his, does his ministry anticipate Christ's new life. That There's a power in Paul's ministry that is, it doesn't belong to Paul, it's God's glory working through him, and it works in such a way that it is veiled to unbelievers. Um, it is, it's only apparent through the eyes of faith, Paul has said. And so he's trying to open Corinth's eyes, as it, as it were, because these other people that they have been listening to, uh, they have this veil over their eyes that Paul has been talking about. And they've basically been putting this veil over Corinth's eyes. And so you have on the one hand these other people that Paul uh, that, that Corinth has been listening to um, who make all of these worldly appeals. Uh, they have all of these worldly signs of power and influence about them. Um, as Paul said last week, they boast about outward appearances. We're going to see... Well, and on the other hand, you have Paul who has none of that, right? He has a, he doesn't have any of the the worldly appeal. He doesn't have any of the flash. He doesn't have any of the polish. Again, he looks like he's suffering and dying all the time. What Paul is worried about is the kind of influence that Corinth is is allowing into their midst. Who's who gets to speak to their hearts? Who gets to form them and shape them in the life of Christ? Is it going to be Paul who himself is imitating Christ? Or is it going to be these worldly peddlers, these charlatans, who are not patterning themselves after Christ and therefore are not equipped to pattern anybody else after Christ? What kind of influence is Corinth going to allow in? So we'll see that concern come out, and we'll see that concern expressed in today's reading. So let's turn together to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, and we will read through chapter 7, verse 4. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, Widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? 
Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will come to you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. So, Paul opens and closes today's text with the same appeal, that Corinth needs to allow Paul into their hearts. There's an influence problem in Corinth that cuts two ways. The one that we have seen the most of so far in this letter is their problem with Paul. They're closing themselves off to Paul because they've, again, for reasons that we talked about earlier, they've become convinced that Paul is not genuine. He's not the real McCoy. And so Paul has spent all of this time uh, talking about, you know, the change, like we said, the, t the changes in his travel plans, um, these things that have led Corinth to to think that Paul is a flake when really he's not, uh, that he changed his plans out of concern for them. Um, it, Paul has also talked about these letters of recommendation and other forms of outward appearances, which, again, leads us to believe that the Corinthians were judging him based on these worldly standards. So the Corinthians were hardening their hearts towards Paul. Uh, they were, as Paul says at the, the opening of today's text, they were restricted by their own affections. Some of them just decided they didn't like Paul, and so they were closing himse themselves off to his ministry. And this is half of the great crisis that the letter is meant to address. So Paul makes this appeal at the beginning and at the end of today's text widen your hearts. So as, as far as Paul is concerned, as far as their relationship with Paul, they need to open themselves up. They need to stop being restricted by their affections. So again, again, some of them just have taken a disliking to Paul. And Paul says you need to widen your hearts, enlarge your hearts, is another way to translate it. He says, we've spoken freely to you. In other words, Paul has been frank with Corinth. He has been open with them because, he says, our heart is wide open. We've, as we've gone along, you've probably gotten the sense that maybe more than any other of Paul's letters that we have preserved in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians shows Paul being really, really vulnerable. I really can't think of another letter that even comes close to 2 Corinthians, just in in terms of how frank and how open and how vulnerable Paul is. He's really bearing himself to Corinth to convince them of his genuine love for them, to try to win them over, because he knows what the stakes are. It's because he actually loves them that he is bearing himself to them. In fact, he you get this sense throughout the letter that he's, he's kind of willing to embarrass himself a little bit on their behalf. And so he goes on to say, look, we've wronged nobody. We've corrupted nobody. We've taken advantage of nobody. And, and perhaps we get a hint here of things that Paul's opponents are guilty of. Right, Paul has taken swipes at his opponents before in this way. Uh, by speaking of what he hasn't done or what he has done, he is reflecting, I think, on the nature of these other people that Corinth has been listening to. 
Paul's wronged nobody. You know, those associated with him have wronged nobody. Well, what about his opponents? Right? We're led to believe that probably they have wronged somebody. Um, and you get the sense, by the way, how this is a, a matter of affection for Corinth. Because you think back to 1 Corinthians. There were people in that church who were willing to take each other to court over being wronged. And Paul had to, you know, again, sit them down and say, look, it would be better for you to be wronged. Let's even assume that the other guy has wronged you. You should not take him to court. Right? He had to talk them down from that position. They, they're not normally people who take this kind of thing sitting down. And yet they've taken a shine to these other people who have come in and started usurping Paul's place as a minister. Um, and so you can see that their affections um, have led them to close themselves off to Paul inappropriately and have also led them to open themselves up to these other people in ways that they, you know, normally wouldn't be. Right? Paul says, we've corrupted nobody. We have taken advantage of nobody. I think those are some pretty big hints about what he wants to say about, well, and ultimately what he will say later in the letter about his opponents. But that's not what Paul focuses on here. Again, perhaps he's taking a swipe at them here. But Paul's main point in saying all of these things is that he is innocent of this behavior. And so the Corinthians should approve of him and associate with him. They should acknowledge him as a brother in Christ, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a minister of the word. So this gives us a general picture, by the way, of, of how we ought to conduct ourselves with each other in the churches. Right? And of course, we should be innocent toward each other. Shouldn't take advantage of anybody, shouldn't wrong anybody, shouldn't corrupt anybody, certainly. But we should also be open with each other. We shouldn't be restricted in our affections. Um, we should be you know, receptive to other Christians who are innocent and open with us. We should be seeking out other people who live after the pattern of the cross rather than those who live by the pattern of the world. It is not uncommon in the churches to find, I do, we, we talk about cliquishness, I think fairly often, um, it's not uncommon to find people in the churches, brothers and sisters in Christ, who simply do not like each other. Um, and I mean, everything differs from case to case. I've seen plenty of cases in my time of people who are closer with unbelieving friends than they are with their fellow Christians ultimately because of a matter of their affections, a matter of their personal tastes, tastes and personality. And and look, don't get me wrong, there I have known plenty of people in the churches who have driven me up the wall, like you know, just on a personal level. Uh, but what what Paul is telling us here is that you know, we shouldn't be like the Grinch. Right? You're, you remember the, uh, at least the animated adaptation of the Grinch. You know, the Grinch's got his heart kind of in this little shrunk down box. Uh, caged in and and is incapable of really having any kind of appropriate response to the people around him. We can be that way. Right? Corinth was that way. And Paul is having to try to talk them out of it. Don't be restricted in your affections. Don't let your personal distaste um, make it to where you're your relationships are going to flip the, the opposite of the way they're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, again, close and open with brothers and sisters in Christ, not restrictive with them. Certainly not uh, more open with unbelievers than we are with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that brings us to the other half of this affection problem at Corinth. And again, it can be a problem for us as well. Um, this, this problem of affection cuts two ways. They're not open enough with Paul, but they are too open 
with this other group of people, which is why Paul tells them not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, we kind of need to throw on the brakes a little bit here because this verse this particular commandment, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, it's, I mean, it's got to be like in the top five most ripped out of context passages in the Bible. Um, it is the kind of thing that, again, I, I put it in the top five because it's one of those passages that I always hear quoted to mean something other than what Paul intends it to mean in this passage. Um especially well let's let's face it when you hear someone in our churches talking well not just in our churches it, this is true of of a lot of denominational folks as well um when you hear someone talking about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers what are they talking about 90 percent of the time if you've got any experience with this 90 percent of the time they're talking about marriage now we're not going to say that this passage has no application to marriage. But what I want us to consider today is what's Paul actually talking about in this passage? What is Paul's point in writing what he wrote? In saying the words, do not be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Look over the letter. You will not find marriage in view. This is, he's certainly not writing about it here in chapter 6. He's not been writing about it in any of the chapters leading up to this. Um, just to give you a preview of where we're going in chapter se the rest of chapter 7, he's going to, going to come back around to um, where he, remember he kind of dropped off in chapter 2, talking about um, Titus. Um, he was looking for Titus, trying to receive word about Corinth, and he couldn't find Titus. And then all of a sudden, that Paul just kind of cuts off there and launches into defending his ministry. He's going to come back around to that in chapter 7. And in chapters 8 and 9, uh, he's going to talk about the collection, the contribution. In chapters 10 through the end of the letter, he is going to go on a really direct assault against these other people that Corinth has been listening to, these so-called super apostles. This is not a letter about marriage. Uh, he has talked about marriage, by the way, in his other letter to Corinth, in which he told people who were married to unbelieving spouses to stay married to them. Um... Uh, now, we can have, on, on a case by case basis, we can have all kinds of discussions about whether this or that arrangement is ideal or less than ideal and the problems that can be associated with it. I do think that there are some lessons to draw from this passage about marriage and about other kinds of relationships. But Paul is not talking about marriage here. Marriage is not why Paul wrote this passage. We need to keep things in their context. What Paul has been, I mean, what has Paul been writing about since the very beginning of this letter? And what's he going to be writing about up to the very end of this letter? He's been writing about Corinth's relationship with him over and against their relationship with Paul's opponents. This is ultimately about these other people that Corinth has been listening to. Now you might think, wait a second. Paul's opponents are, they're bad guys, certainly, but it'd probably be too far to call them unbelievers. Well, as we've seen, you know, these, these people have been competing with Paul on the basis of their Christian ministry, which is why perhaps we might be reluctant to see this, uh, this particular commandment as being about them. Don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Well, anyway, they're, they're not unbelievers. All right, we can call them all kinds of things, but not unbelievers. Well, maybe we have missed what Paul has called them already in this letter. He's been, at points, subtle about it, at other points, less subtle. And by the end of this letter, he's going to be about as subtle as a brick to the face. But Paul, well, 
let's just see what Paul really thinks about these opponents of his. Would Paul call them wayward Christians, people who are believers just with worldly ideas? Um, well, he starts with his critique of these people in chapter 2, verse 17, by saying, We are not like so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. All right, so this is kind of an, an early swipe at these other people that Corinth has been listening to. We are not like so many peddlers of God's word. So it, to start out with, Paul's opponents are not genuine ministers of the word. They are they're peddlers, right? They're trying to make a buck off of the word of God or what they're presenting is the word of God. It probably ultimately makes no difference to them. They're not in it for the word of God. They're in it for the money. We're led to believe in the very next verse, in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, that these people, these peddlers of God's word, deal in letters of recommendation. They deal in other tokens of, in other worldly tokens of legitimacy because they are engaged in a worldly enterprise, not a divine one. All right, and so, and you, do you remember, uh, Paul goes on to describe the glory that God has revealed through his own ministry, and that takes us to chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. We're going to go ahead and put this up on the screen and read it together, just to remind us of where we've been. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. All right, and certainly you caught what Paul said there. Paul has already again, taken a swipe at these other people, these peddlers of God's word, um, by saying, again, talking about what he doesn't do as a way of talking about what these other people do. Yeah, right? He says, we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. All right? So we need to bear in mind here that Paul is talking about people who are at least ostensibly preaching the word of God. But they're tampering with it. Uh, they are, they're using it as a tool. Again, these people are peddlers. They're not actual ministers of the word. And Paul calls these same people, right? And it's, it's in this very same context. Paul calls these people unbelievers. It's not Gentile pagans who are tampering with God's word. It is these people who are passing themselves off as ministers of God, and Paul calls them unbelievers. He says that, that God's the, the, the true glory of Christian ministry is not visible to them. It's not apparent to them because they've got the veil over their face. Right? That glory has been hidden from them. Now, if that's not brazen enough, Paul's going to become, again, the end of the letter is like, it's, it's about as subtle as a baseball bat. Paul is going to become incredibly brazen by the end of the letter. Um, let's get a little preview of what Paul is going to have to say about these men. Uh, if we turn to chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. What I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, 
for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Tell us what you really think about them, Paul. <laughs> He's, he has called them names that, I mean, you know, I've, I've witnessed my fair share of conflict in the churches of Christ, but I've, I've never heard anybody <laughs> use this kind of language uh, with somebody that they disagree with. These men are false apostles. They are pretenders. They've disguised themselves as apostles of Christ, but they are really, Paul says, servants of the adversary. So if Paul is saying this about his opponents, right, again, he's earlier on in the letter, he's taking these swipes at them. I mean, maybe somebody wouldn't be convinced that Paul's actually directly talking about these these other people, these opponents of his, uh, whenever he is talking about unbelievers, uh, that he's just... I, at this point, you have to acknowledge, no, Paul is not talking about somebody else. He's talking about these opponents of his. And he just, I mean, he calls a spade a spade. They are pretending to be apostles. They are pretending ultimately to be Christians. It really should not be that much of a wonder to us that Paul refers to them as unbelievers in today's text. And so Paul lays out, I mean, exactly what it means for these opponents of his to be worldly. It means that they have aligned themselves with the world. And Paul's been making this case all along. But they've what that means is they've aligned themselves with darkness. They've aligned themselves with lawlessness, with the adversary. And Paul says, look, if you're in Christ, what do you have to do with any of that? He's warning Corinth against falling into the same unbelieving error that these opponents of his have fallen into, right? They are members of, of lawlessness, of darkness. They've sided with the adversary. And Paul uses the, the unique name here, Belial, uh, for the adversary. Um, he says, look, you're, if you're Christians, you can't line up with any of that. Right? You're the temple of the living God. Paul says, and what portion does the temple of the living God have with idols? Right, so these opponents of his, not only are they unbelievers, they are idolaters. They are as good as pagans, Paul says. They might have the name of Christ on their lips, but they are as good as pagans. This is entirely consistent, by the way, with what our Lord himself said in the Gospels. Right, that in the end, there's going to be all kinds of people who say to me, oh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and that in your name? And what's the Lord going to say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity or lawlessness. Right? I never knew you, the Lord says. These are the kinds of people that Jesus was talking about there in Matthew chapter 7. These people who have come into Corinth pretending to be ministers of the word, calling themselves Christians, and yet presenting a worldly message, a perverted gospel that is basically just worldliness that has been baptized. Right? We don't know the exact details of what it is that they're, they're presenting, but we know the general picture of it. We know what camp it puts these men in and what camp it will put Corinth in if they continue to listen to them. And so Paul says, you've got to get your affections in check. There's something about these guys that you like, and you know, based on everything that Paul has said, it's probably those worldly shows of power. The, Cor the Corinthians really dig that kind of thing. Paul says you've got to get your affections in check. Learn who you really ought to love and who you really ought to close yourselves off to. Because this isn't this isn't some competition. The competition between Paul and his opponents is not some competition between Christians. This is between an apostle of Jesus Christ and false apostles who do not belong to Christ, even though they have his name on their lips. And so Paul reminds Corinth of what the law and the prophets have to say. That Corinth is to be the temple of the living God, and that 
being such, they are to separate themselves from the uncleanness of the world. And Paul strings together several quotations from the law and the prophets to show that this is this is the general message of all the law and the prophets, right? He picks out a little bit here from, uh, oh, I've forgotten off the top of my head where all the passages are from. He's picked out one for, towards the end from Samuel. He's picked out some, uh, I believe, from Isaiah. I mean, from all over the place. Each one of these statements is from a different spot in the Law and the Prophets. The general message of the Law and the Prophets is that we are to be a holy people dedicated to God. That means we should not be allowing these kinds of influences into our lives. right? It, it, and Paul has said elsewhere, that doesn't mean isolating ourselves from the world. He's told Corinth that, right? In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he has said, look, when I told you not to you know, associate with this kind of thing. I didn't mean for you to cut yourselves off from the world. I meant to, you cut yourselves off from people who proclaim the name of Christ who are behaving in this way. Here, they failed again at that. Um, Corinth's position has been the exact opposite of that. They are allowing these people in and allowing them, they're, they're receiving counsel spiritual counsel from these people. They are getting their spiritual and religious teaching from worldly people, and they ought not be doing that. So the call for us today is to exercise the same shrewdness in our affections. We've got to open ourselves to the teachings of the apostles and the teachings of our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who genuinely imitate Christ in their lives, and we need to close ourselves to the teachings of worldly shysters, because there are plenty of them in this world. There are plenty of people who have the name of Christ on their lips who do not teach Christ, and I'm not just generically talking about the denominations. Um, we, we, we see plenty of it all over the place, and it can creep into the churches of Christ just as easily as it creeps in anywhere else. There are some who preach a false gospel of worldly prosperity, and again, try to baptize that, dress that up as godliness, right? We could, I mean, we could very easily name names with that. We've got all these televangelists like, you know, Joel Osteen preaching these, you know, this prosperity gospel, uh, you know, that because God loves you, if you really have faith in God, he's going to do all of these He's going to give you all of these worldly things. Um, we've seen that. Honestly, we've we've even seen that to an extent over the past year with the coronavirus. Um, this this belief that, well, you know, if you're a godly person, you just go do whatever you want. You just, so long as you have faith in God, He's going to protect you from the virus. That's a where do you read that in the gospel? Right? That is, that's a false worldly promise that tries to turn the faith of Jesus Christ into something that it's not. Um, it's, I mean, it's like saying, you know, if only you had enough faith, you know, you'd, you know, put five rounds in the, in the, uh, in the revolver and give it a spin and just have faith. Again, that's not what faith is about. That's not the faith of Jesus Christ. And there are plenty of others. There are some who, they preach a false gospel of nationalistic pride. We see these, these events. The one that sticks out most prominently to me uh, is one that happens on a yearly basis at First Baptist Dallas uh, that Robert Jeffress hosts uh, called Freedom Sunday, where if, if you were to work, walk into First Baptist Dallas on Freedom Sunday, you would not know you were in a an alleged church because the whole place is festooned with American flags and they've invited in the vice president to speak and they're giving these messages not about the gospel of Jesus Christ but about um, how, you know, this is supposed to be a Christian country and... Um, centering everything on on their politics, and that's just 
That's a worldly, perverted gospel. It is worldliness dressed up as the gospel, pretending to be the gospel. There's all kinds, of, and I'm just naming, naming a couple of examples. Uh, things that you see all over the place in America today. That's not the limit of it, right? The adversary's got all kinds of people peddling, tampered with versions of God's word all over the place. And brothers and sisters, we need to be shrewd about that. Just because somebody comes to you and says, I have the word of the Lord, or I'm a prophet of the Lord, or you know, any of these other, just because somebody's able to quote scripture at you, does not mean that they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You look at the fruit. Right, this, again, this is what Paul has been trying to get across through this entire letter. You look at Paul, he's dying like Christ. And so, you know, you ask yourself, are, are these people dying like Christ? Or are they pursuing some kind of worldly token of success? We have to avoid these false gospels. We have to embrace Christ crucified, a message again, that looks like humiliation and death to the world but which we know to be the power of God. So today's message, I think it was a pretty brief one. I don't have my glasses on. If you've wondered about that, by the way, I figure I'll give you a little um, you know, behind-the-scenes explainer here. Um, I've been taking my glasses off recently uh, because the way I've got things set up in the office here, if I have the glasses on, you just see everything reflected in the glasses. So... I can't actually see how long I've been recording. I think this was a shorter one, though, um, because the message today was fairly simple, fairly straightforward, and I hope that that message has been helpful to you. Um, again, there are going to be people, genuine brothers and sisters in Christ, who you're just not going to like, and the short and simple message today is get over it. <laughs> Widen your heart. Open up your heart. It, again, it, we could compare it to the Grinch. You remember that scene where you see like the little cage around his heart bursting as the heart is growing. That's kind of the way that you want to aim with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Somebody drives you up the wall, tough, right? You'd be a grown-up. Um, if somebody really catches your eye, catches your attention, don't be blinded by that. Uh, if somebody's got some flashy message that looks really attractive, dig into it. Be shrewd about it. You know, we hope that this has been useful to you, that this has been helpful to you. Um, we make that call for all who are followers of Jesus Christ. It may be that if you're watching this or listening to this, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. We invite you to become one. Get in contact with the Church of Christ near you. If you're in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, get in contact with us, the 14th Avenue Church of Christ. Any church that you go to is going to be more than happy to study the way of Jesus Christ with you, the way of Christ crucified, a way again, that we said looks like humiliation and death to the world, but we know it to be the way of life. Uh, that just as we share in Christ's crucifixion, we share also in his new life. It is the power of God and the salvation, Paul says elsewhere. So we invite you to believe in the good news of Christ, to repent of your sins, turn away from them. As Paul was talking about in today's text, uh, we seek to be clean, unspotted from the sins of this world. So turn away from sin, turn towards righteousness, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. So that's it for us this week. We hope to see you next week as we continue our study. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.